Well, thank you, Bill. Thank you, everybody. Psalmist says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Amen. Hallelujah. And we're here today to do that today, to magnify the Lord and also, of course, to learn from his word and uh, to have fellowship with each other and sundry other things. Most of all, we seek to see our Lord uplifted and glorified amongst us here today. It truly was a great conference this last week. And if I can speak on behalf of all the delegates, which I have no power to do, but I'll do anyway, um, <laughs> just to thank you and thank you for the church here for uh, just wonderful care and hosting while we were here. It's a, just a, a pleasure, pleasure to be in this place. And you've done it so many times. And uh, I think special thanks to Kathy, who's just an amazing hostess. So we're just very grateful for that. And I'm sure if I did have authority to speak on half of everybody, they'd be okay with that. So there we go. <laughs> All right. Um, Pastor Bill, we just, we just prayed for your book, and I want to say to everybody here that um, you should get a copy, if you possibly can, or buy copies for Philippines or somewhere. And if you have any money left, <laughs> <laughs> we have a few books out there in the foyer as well. I just want to quickly mention my personal practical prayer diary. How many of you have got one of these already? Oh, goodness. The rest of you need one. Uh, seriously, if you use this, it will help you to pray more effectively. That's a simple statement. It's true. Um, but how many of you could pray better than you do? <laughs> so, I mean, you all could. So I'm not trying to tell you you should pray. You know that. But this will help you to pray more effectively. Uh, they're only $5. That's basically cost. We sell those at cost. We've sold thousands of them over the last couple of years, uh, probably 5,000 the last couple of years. So many people are snapping them up. When we step out, God steps in, it's all the $10 volume. These, this is a collection of messages I preached at Wesley International Congregation a few years ago. Uh, it would not, I checked my wife before I said this, but it would not be an exaggeration to say that this really um, revolutionized many of the things we did in our church and uh, it just, just transformed the church, really, and transformed many people's lives in all sorts of ways. Uh, so when we step out, God steps in. We step out in faith, God steps in with power. And the people still remember those messages that when I go there to visit, preaching there next Sunday, uh, somebody will certainly quote that to me. They always do, because uh, that just became a kind of a, a vision statement for our church. About angels and you. Christmas time is coming up. Your little book would be a great gift for people for Christmas. When people think about angels, most of what we see on Christmas cards with angels in them is wrong. Um, most of the cards about anything with angels in them are wrong. So... And even Charles Wesley was wrong when he said, Hark the herald angels sing. The Bible never says they sang. So, so some of those myths are debunked in there, but also a lot of questions. Why does God use angels? Why, does that, why does that, doesn't he just do it himself? What's the work of angels? Where do they come from? What do they do? It's only $10. And other books, there's a heap of other stuff. Everything's below cost. And if you don't have cash, if you spend it all on Bill's books, you can use a card to buy some of ours. Uh, seriously, that's what I do these days. I preach and I write, and uh, that's our ministry. So if you can support our ministry, that would be fantastic. Um, even more important, if you can read and be blessed, that would be fantastic too. I know reading is going out of fashion these days. I know a lot of people don't do it, but in fact, uh, it's a very good thing to do. All right, I want to speak to you this morning on the theme, the offense of the cross. The offense of the cross. Uh, I was... Um, given some background information for this morning and specifically asked to speak from Galatians chapter 5. So amazingly, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> when I was at... we got a clock back again. Yeah. It was wonderful this morning, the earliest of no clock. Yeah. <laughs> Preacher's paradise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I still don't know when I'm supposed to finish, so I... It's going to tell me, isn't it? All right. Quarter two. Quarter two. Golly. <laughs> yeah, but I've got a bit more extra time. Well, well, okay. Boy, that's not much. Okay. When I was 10 years old, and for those who want to know, that was uh, 
long time ago. Uh, <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it was 1949. Um, I went to a boys' camp run by what was by the Crusade Union then, which we now was part of Scripture Union. And the speaker was a man named Alec Brown, Mr. H. A. Brown. He's a magnificent ch uh, children's evangelist. He could um, twist his face into all sorts of amazing contortions to try and convey characterization. Just brilliant, especially with boys. And on the Friday night of the camp, which uh, I went to, it was at Victor Harbour. We uh, went to the Church of Christ building there. Uh, I can still picture it. It was uh, it's still like this today. It has a, like, seats were like garden benches along sort of horizontal slats along the seats. They're quite uncomfortable, but I've never seen a church with those sort of seats before. And I was sitting on the right-hand side about halfway down. Mr. Brown preached on John 3, 14 to 15. And uh, I call him Mr. Brown because that's all anybody ever called him that I knew. And um, he spoke on this, this text, as, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And he told the story of how a plague of snakes came upon the Israelites and God told Moses to put a snake, a brass snake up on a pole and whoever looked at that snake would live. And he said how there was a tapestry in the, I think Oxford University or somewhere that depicted this story and it had the snake on the pole, the brass snake on the, the pole and the people around, the snakes everywhere. And it showed different people doing different things like there's one person running, running like mad trying to get away from the snakes. And even as he ran, he was treading on other snakes and he was about to die. And Mr. Brown said, all he had to do was look, and he would have lived. He chose to run, and he died. And there's someone else over here on their knees praying fervently for God to deliver them from the snakes. And while they're praying, they get bitten, and while they're praying, they're dying. And Mr. Brown said, if only they had looked, they would have lived. And there's someone else who's uh, on their knees helping a person who'd been bitten. And while they were helping, they themselves were being attacked and about to die. Only they had looked, said Mr. Brown. And um, then there's someone else who's trying to fight them off and kicking and trying to push them away. And even as he fights, he's dying. Only he had looked, said Mr. Brown. And the message was simple. Just look to the cross. Because Jesus said that the snake represented the cross. As, the, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Um, and um, I decided that night that was a pretty good idea. So I decided to look to Jesus. And that was the beginning of my Christian life 69 years ago. And all that time since being walking with the Lord. And I remember the following Sunday morning, just two days later, we went to the Congregational Church in Victor Harbour, a big circular building that some of you may know, and very impressive structure. And that Sunday morning we had joined the congregation, all these, uh, I don't know how many there were, 60, 100 maybe of us boys. Um, and uh, we sang the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. I remember just uh, there and my heart just kind of swelling with gratitude and love for Jesus. And it was just, a, 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 I, I can still picture myself in that church building all those years ago with this great, uh, like a um, child, childish, I suppose, but childhood passion just to follow the Lord and, and uh, my uh, and, uh, fascination with the cross. And I sure didn't understand it all then, but a kind of fascination with it that I, I come to realize more deeply later on. And I uh, memorized a few years later Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. We're at chapter 5 this morning. Mem memorized Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, uh, which says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And I, I love that verse, crucified with Christ. And I uh, began to realize that uh, not only was Jesus crucified, but all my sin and all my pain and all my wickedness and all my evil and all my self-centeredness in particular, it was all crucified with him. It all died on the cross there with him. And it was just a, an amazing realization. And that text became a kind of a, a, a favorite verse of mine. And uh, when I was about 14 or 15, I remember I, I got the, the words of that verse and I copied them all down on a large sheet of white cardboard. No text to colors or anything in those days and no printers and no computers or anything. So uh, I, uh, we had, a, I think, I had some watercolor paints and a paintbrush and I painted these letters in. It must have looked awful. I can't think it was very good. But anyway, uh, then I just uh, took it to church one day and I took a hammer and some nails and I went to the church hall at the back. And I just nailed this up on the wall of the church hall. <laughs> I think, golly. I think we had a pastor at that stage and you could get away with things you'd never get away with now. 
But it stayed there, nobody pulled it down, it stayed there for ages, this, uh, this Galatians 2.20 verse. So in, the, in this letter to the Galatians, Paul talks about the cross quite often, and in chapter 5, uh, he picks it up again, but he begins the chapter in Galatians 5 verse 1, and um, it says, For freedom Christ has set us free, stand firm therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. And uh, that's what my experience was, I realised that through the cross I'd been set free. Uh, of, of myself, to put it in simpler terms, that, that everything about me and everything of me uh, and uh, all my self-centeredness had all been crucified. And so I could stand firm, therefore, in the freedom for which Christ had set me free. And the cross, his penalty and his punishment became my liberation and my freedom. It's just, an, a, a, just a wonderful, one of those many wonderful mysteries in the Scripture that uh, become, no longer become mysteries when the Holy Spirit unlocks them to you. So in this passage, it begins, and it's a marvelous beginning, for freedom of Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore. Do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And having given that wonderful introduction, the next verse in chapter 5 of Galatians says, Look, I, Paul, say to you, if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I thought, what's this about circumcision? We're talking about freedom and liberty. And it seems like Paul comes from a great height down to a very earthy sort of a subject. But what had happened was that uh, the Galatian churches, there are a number of churches in Galatia, um, had been beset and attacked by Judaizers, people uh, with a Mosaic religion, who were trying to say to them that unless they accepted circumcision, which only applied to the men, of course, as they accepted circumcision or, and also the Mosaic law, then they were not truly followers of God. And Paul saw this as a serious problem so he began to say to them, look, that's not what it's like. Far from circumcision helping you to be acceptable to God, it's more likely to have the very opposite effect. Now, I don't want to have a lot of conversation about circumcision, but we need to say a couple of things about it because it seems a rather bizarre thing. So how it came into being was this. In Genesis 15, 17, there's a story of a covenant that God made with Abraham. And two or three times in the chapter, he says to Abraham, you're going to become the father of a multitude of nations. And kings will descend from you, and nations will descend from you, uh, and uh, multitudes of people all around the world. And so it's a wonderful promise, especially given the fact that Abraham was 99 years old and still needed a son to start the process. <laughs> that was a magnificent promise. And we call it an Abrahamic covenant. And then after going through all the, this exciting stuff, uh, then God says, this is the covenant I'm making with you. This is the covenant, multitude of nations, and so on. And this is the sign of the covenant. Every male has to be circumcised, starting with you. And so, but poor Abraham, 99 years old, and he's got to get circumcised. And, <laughs> and, then, uh, and then he had, a, he had one son already, Ishmael, um, but the promise wasn't through Ishmael. And then the, so every male in his household had to get circumcised. It must have been a mournful day in their household for that day. But, but you see, why, why this bizarre uh, ceremony? Surely there's going to be something different. Well, I think there's some symbolism in circumcision, and forgive me if I just mentioned a couple of things briefly, that um, it was, um, well, first of all, just by the way, there were health benefits because in a desert nomadic community, it probably helped men to keep their hygiene in better shape as it does in Africa today, which is one of the anti-AIDS procedures. But uh, in this covenantal thing, uh, it seems like there, were some, there was some symbolism there. Given that the covenant was based on a multitude of people, a multitude of descendants, then um, a sign in the reproductive system, the reproductive organ was probably relevant to, as a constant reminder to Abraham and the men of Israel of this covenant and, this, and being part of their reproduction system. Also, of course, the, the men, uh, that's a great symbolism of their drive and their uh, passion, a uh, very strong motivator in, 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 men, in men's lives. Um, it's a, it was a very private, personal thing. Um, it also, among other things, involves shedding of blood. And it's interesting how, remember how, how Jesus rebuked his disciples because they did not understand that he was to be crucified. He said, it was, he said it's in the whole Bible. And you say, well, where was it? Well, it was in a lot of the things that happened. The whole sacrificial system was a, a prophetic system because it didn't have much other effect, value. The prophetic system of the day when the great sacrifice would be made, that would be the end of all sacrifices. And, and 
I think circumcision was, in a small way, another sign of that. It was kind of a sign to the men, really, that, look, this is a little thing, relatively speaking, but there is shedding of blood, and every covenant of God involves bloodshed, which it does through the Old Testament. So there are those symbolic things there with it. But Paul's concern is, is something rather different from that. And uh, Paul has some very strong things to say about circumcision. And if we just uh, go further through the chapter here, uh, first of all, in, in verse 2, he says, if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. That's a strong statement. Strong statement. By this mere act of circumcision, they're actually uh, neutralizing the whole work of Christ. Pretty powerful stuff. Verse 3, he says, if you accept circumcision, you're obligated to keep the whole law. The principle being that if you start thinking that by doing one thing, you can gain acceptance with God, then you can do other things as well to add to that acceptability. And then in verse 4, very strong, he says, if you will be justified by the law, you are severed from Christ, cut off from Christ. And it's interesting that the apostle here is clearly thinking about circumcision and he uses this word severed two or three twice in this passage and he uses a similar word for a third time, which is a play upon words. He said, okay, circumcision severs a bit of flesh, but if you get circumcised, you are severing everything from Christ. You're cutting yourself off from Christ. Very strong stuff. And then he says, you have fallen from grace, the end of verse 4. If you seek to be justified in this way, you have fallen from grace. And uh, that's a statement that's become part of our common language these days. And then, uh, uh, then in verse, five, verse 6, he says, Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. And the, the whole idea here is, is he, he, I read that last verse there, because he clearly says, Neither being circumcised or not being circumcised accounts for anything, but it's only faith that works through love. And so the point is, it's not the actual thing itself, but it's, it's your dependence on it, which is the problem. And for Jewish men, being circumcised is a sign of acceptance, a sign of acceptability, whereby they can say, well, this proves that I'm acceptable to God because I've been circumcised. You've got to take their word for it because you're not going to know, but, they, um, but that's what they think. And Paul's saying anything at all, whatever it is, that we depend upon for acceptability cuts us off from Christ. Cuts us off from Christ. It neutralizes the gospel. If we've fallen from grace, it is none of those that, that things are any good. So our problem is that we also can depend on things that are not circumcised, but can, ha can have a similar effect. I mean, <clears throat> just to broaden it a little bit, let's imagine that God had said to the Israelites, every man among you must have a tattoo on his left shoulder. See, that would have, could have been the same thing once they got that because, oh, I've got my tattoo, therefore I'm one of God's people. I mean, we're just, it's, it's not circumcision as such. It's, it's any action like that. Um, or God could have asked for any sort of thing. He could have uh, um, required every man to play AFL. That's the Abrahamic Football League. <laughs> I mean, so anything at all that we depend upon for our righteousness, for our acceptability, anything at all we depend upon is uh, neutralizes the gospel. Some people argue that uh, infant baptism is a kind of a modern equivalent of circumcision. Well, it's only if that's true, it's not really very good because circumcision was only for boys, not for girls. So they're, they're really, but in any sense, they're just not, all sorts of reasons, they're not, not equated. But there is a similarity there, though. Um, you know what happens when you're immunized, don't you? Immunization gives you a kind of a, a low dose of a certain disease or a low infection of a certain disease, and that then prevents you getting the real disease later on. Infant baptism is like that. It gives you a small dose of religion that stops you getting the real thing later on. Ooh. Well, how many of you are like that? You baptize as a baby but never knew Christ. Huh? Some people here like that? A few people, bold people waving to me. Yeah. And so it's so not like anything like that. And this, I read some years ago in England, it's an old statistic now, th that time there were 28 million Anglicans in England, 3 million of them attended church. The other 25 million, all baptized as kids, never, never, never went near a church. So, 
Because very likely, if you asked them if they were Christians, they would have said yes. Because they had the mark that they baptized. So here, um, Paul then says this um, surprising thing in verse um, 11, where he says, if, if I preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, he says the offense of the cross has been removed. So has my microphone. I think. Okay. All right. No, it's not all right. What have I done here? Can you fix it? Thanks, yes. think so thanks you can tell me all right um so it makes this interesting statement in verse 11 he says if i brothers still preach circumcision why am i being persecuted in that case the offense of the cross has been removed now you might think that phrase and i i called it the scandal of the cross on the screen before um wh why would there be a why would the cross be offensive why would it be scandalous well, it's scandalous and it's offensive because it offends us <laughs> by telling us that there's nothing we can do that can make us any more acceptable to God than we already are. The cross is 100% effective and the cross absolutely protects us and absolutely saves us. And so... Uh, it therefore offends our self-righteousness, it offends our self-reliance, because it keeps saying to us, well, it doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't make you any more acceptable, or any less acceptable. So, and, and so often, we miss this. One of, one of the wonderful things about being the CRC is this understanding of the, the new creation message. And uh, I agree with you, Bill, I thought the choice of songs at the conference was very good in that sense. Because so often we get songs that are just um, pleading with God uh, to bless us because we've done this or done that or because we're so far from God. And it's all, a lot of it is simply just ignoring the fullness of the gospel that we have. And so, uh, and we have, there's a lot of popular kind of misunderstandings. People say, well, I've just got to pray a lot more. If I pray a lot harder, pray a lot more, uh, then uh, that will give me more acceptability to God won't make any difference to that. might make a difference to other things, but it's not going to affect your acceptability. What if I read the Bible more? I can do a lot more Bible study. Well, that may be very valuable in all sorts of ways. I certainly, certainly will be. And this prayer diary is a way of helping you to pray and read the Bible better. But it doesn't make us any more acceptable. <laughs> There's nothing that can make us any more acceptable to God except what Jesus has done through the cross. It's, it's absolutely complete in its efficacy in saving us from sin and, and making us right with God. And we can apply that to, uh, to music, um, to, or even to the wonderful people here who worked so hard last week. Uh, it sure made you more acceptable to me, <laughs> but, but it didn't make any difference to your standing with God, I'm sad to say, glad to say. And that can be offensive. You, can say, you mean to say, I worked hard all this week and God doesn't love me anymore? Yeah. Well, he can't love you anymore. He already loves you an absolute level. He can't love you any more than he loves you now, and he can't love you any less. Because God's love is a perfect love. And so all our efforts, we strive so hard, we do, we do not do them to be more acceptable. We do them simply because they're good things to do and they bless other people, and it's, it's just fine that we should do those things. So that's why we have this, info, this phrase, and I called it the scandal of the cross because in the Greek word, the word is basically the word scandal. But the word offense is probably a, more, is a better English um, translation of that. So if we could, if we you're reading the scripture, if you wanted to um, take out the word circumcision and put in uh, helping with conference <laughs> or uh, um, praying more, uh, put those words in. Um, good things in themselves, but if any of those things, no matter how good, become the basis of our salvation we are in trouble and this is a major difference between christianity and all other religions that pretty well every other religion says what we do earns us credit with god 
It's, it's always us looking at God. And most Australians think that's what it is. Think, oh, well, as long as I do the right thing by my neighbor and I don't do anything too bad and I help people, then, yeah. But that's not the gospel. The gospel says, that unfortunately, it doesn't matter what we do, it's never enough. But the sacrifice of Christ is all sufficient. And that's true freedom. So Paul goes on in chapter 6 now of Galatians 14 to say, God forbid that I should boast in anything except the cross. It's probably there on the screen. Um, the cross, and notice what he says, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. That's what the cross does. It not only crucifies us, it crucifies the world to us. So the power of the world over us is diminished. And everything changes through the cross. What we do, we learn to see everything through the lens of the cross. And when we look through the cross, it's like a marvellous kind of a microscope, telescope combined. It, uh, it magnifies little things, it diminishes big things. It gets things in perspective. And things that look like they might be so big, whether they're problems or fears or projects or dreams, whatever, look like they're huge. Through the cross, they suddenly shrink down to what they really mean. And things that look so tiny, like little acts of kindness or love or little thoughtful comments or little prayers, all of a sudden they become much bigger because we see them through the cross, which gets everything right and everything in balance. So Paul, having talked about the offense of the cross, now says, I'm going to boast in the cross. I'm going to glory in it, to use your King James Version wording, because that's our boast and that's our glory. And in that, we can truly rejoice. And going back to my childhood days, I remember how in my little Baptist church uh, down at Woodville North, it used to be called Finsbury Park in those days. Oh, yeah, I remember sitting there cold Sunday mornings in the winter because we had no heating in the church in those days. You had to come with your overcoats and scarves and hats and everything. I remember sitting there um, just uh, Sunday morning communion service and uh, s contemplating, meditating the, the blood of Christ and the body of Christ and thinking, oh, Lord, uh, so wonderful. And the cross became such a, a focal point for me. And I became in danger. So I used to wear a little cross badge. I became in danger of um, making that <laughs> more important than the actual cross itself. But it couldn't be, only the cross itself. And now thinking of Jesus on the cross and thinking of how he hung there in complete self-denial, complete self-denial, uh, repudiation of everything that could ever be called worthy. Oh, just gone. He just hangs there and, and uh, dies there, not only physically suffering but suffering the unbearable weight of human sin just bowing down upon him and then you know just not just your sin I mean yours and mine would be enough but think of the sin of everybody here in this place this morning all just piled upon Jesus and then because we're a reasonably good bunch that mightn't be too bad but think of all the whole city of Adelaide and everybody here and then all of Australia and then all of Europe and all of Africa and all of China and all those people and all their sin all gathered together one awful, horrible, arc, dark, ugly mass and concentrated in concentrated form upon Jesus. And then think for that includes you know, people of all time, not just the people of our time and all those people yet to come. And so you've got Adolf Hitler and Genghis Khan and Pol Pot and Joseph Stalin and all these people, all their you know, horrible mass murdering crimes all concentrated, laid on Jesus. You know, the ultimate suffering. The ultimate suffering. Nobody has ever suffered like that. Never. People have suffered physically maybe as worse, as badly if not worse. But nobody has suffered like that. And that was God's remedy for sin. And it dealt with sin, gave us new hope, new life, and it gave us freedom. Freedom from guilt and freedom from fear and freedom from sin and freedom from ourselves as we see things through that wonderful cross. I remember sitting there in that little Baptist church, my childhood, what, early teen days, and just uh, my heart just swelling with love for Jesus and a passionate desire to serve him, which by itself, I hope I'm still doing. 
There's a great, one of the greatest hymn writers in the, our history is Isaac Watts, child of the Methodist revival. And uh, one of his greatest hymns was the hymn that I referred to earlier, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. We look at that word survey and we think, oh, what does that mean? It's, we think of surveyors and engineering and everything, but it's simply an old word for looking or gazing upon. Um, I get very frustrated sometimes with some songs that I hear in some churches I visit which are so, where the lyrics are so trite and so shallow, and, uh, so non-memorable. But, but in this hymn, Isaac Watts was a poet. When I survey... Like even, yeah, I know. Um, I mean, even, um, I was going to use it. Um, when I survey, when I gaze at the wondrous cross, and Watts originally wrote, where the young prince of glory died. Jesus was a young man. When I gaze upon the wondrous cross, where the young prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but loss. When you see things through the cross, it puts everything in perspective. My richest gain, I count but loss. And poor, poor contempt, you know, poured on. I pour contempt on all my pride. You see the ugliness of pride. See, look, from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet? Or thorns compose so rich a crown? Then he prays, forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my Lord. All the vain things, all the empty things, all the vain things that charm me. It's beautiful poetry. Can you think of this word charm? All the things that lure us and tempt us because they seem so appealing. All the empty things, all the vain things that charm me most. I sacrifice them to his blood. And then comes this last declaration. Magnificent. Were the whole realm of nature mine. In other words, if I owned the whole earth and everything in it, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, demands, demands my soul, my life, my all. It's a great song. And it brings us back. We're going to boast. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast. Save in the cross, save in the death. There's a grounds for boasting. There's something to be proud about. There's something to glory in and to gladly bear with it the offence of the cross. How's that, Kath? Right on, 11.45, eh? <laughs> yeah. We're going to sing that hymn if you'd like to sing it. We don't get too excited. We have a bit more ministry afterwards yet. We're just going to sing a hymn just right now. Yeah. Perhaps you could stand said, so, well, no, an old song, and just uh, let it speak to your heart. You know, I told you how my heart used to swell. You now, well, let, let your heart swell. Let your heart respond to this this morning. Don't just sing it. You know, when it says, uh, you know, talk, when it gives a personal line that I should boast and so on, you know, sing it for yourself as you're singing it. Let's make it a reality this morning. When I survey. <laughs> 